Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Jet lag is one of those fun byproducts of international travel. Your mind tells you that it's time to sleep, but your body says it's time to wake up, or vice versa. It all has to do with your circadian rhythm and the blood sugar levels in your body, which peak and and fall at different times of the day. There's all kinds of strategies for dealing with uh, jet lag, like taking melatonin or timing your meals, or even the airlines give you a blindfold that you can put over your eyes to help you sleep during the flight. I have yet to get a good night's sleep on any international flight. It just takes time to adjust about one day for every hour difference in the time zones. Of course, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can just sit there and and lie in bed and wait for the sun to come up. But what do you do with a three-year-old who wakes up at 2 a.m. and wants to play? What do you tell your hosts the next day who were sleeping in the bedroom right next door and heard your kids running around. Time. That's a funny thing, isn't it? We know that time flows at a constant rate. And yet, even though you could use an atomic clock to accurately measure the progress of time, why does it seem that the last 20 minutes of a college lecture on a Friday afternoon seem to take three hours while spending three hours watching your favorite NFL team cream its opponent seems to only take 20 minutes. Why does time fly when you're having fun? Dopamine? That's the scientific explanation for it, but it seems too simple. It's your perception of time passing changes according to your situation. Different cultures have different perspectives on time as well. Different cultures have different expectations. In Western cultures, people value highly being on time. There's a famous quote from the Green Bay Packers football coach Vince Lombardi. He said to his players, 15 minutes early is on time. On time is late. And late is unacceptable. Once I was on my way to a meeting at my denomination's headquarters, and of course, I didn't adequately adjust for the traffic delays, and I arrived about five minutes late for my meeting with my tail between my legs. Now, lateness is a cardinal sin. (laughs) It's seen as being disrespectful of other people. That's because Westerners place a high value on doing things in an effective way. We even have a phrase, we're saving time or we're wasting time. Now, in other cultures, it's not as important to save time as it is to save face. And not get angry at people when they arrive late. Sometimes they might arrive as much as an hour or more later than the appointed time. Why is this? Well, of course, there are lots of reasons why people don't arrive on time in other countries. Trains may arrive within seconds of the posted schedule in a place like Germany. Malawian public transportation consists of private minivans whose drivers wait at the stop until they've gathered enough passengers together 
to pay for the gas. And they make frequent stops along the route to pick up more people. They're actually uh, people called callboys that hang out the window and announce the, lo the destination of where the minivan is going. And if anybody indicates an interest in getting on that minivan, they slow down and pick them up right there along the side of the road. Then, of course, and, and there are mechanical breakdowns, which, you know, happen frequently. And the driver leaves the vehicle in the middle of the road, as well as the passengers who are left just there by the side of the road to find their own way to, forward, to go forward, while the driver goes and gets some help to fix his vehicle. Or your lateness might be due to the fact that you got a call from someone who was desperately asking for your help right as you were heading out the door. And of course, you can't say no to such a request. I mean, after all, you might require his help at some point in the future. So that's why you're late. Or maybe you told somebody that you'd arrive at such and such a time, knowing all the while that there's no possible way you could make it at that time at all. But you tell them what they want to hear, because it's not good manners to say, no, I can't make it. In many parts of the world, you wouldn't dare take someone to task about their arriving late, or about their taking three times as long as promised to fix your car, or to build a bookcase. It's just not acceptable to put people on the spot. Now, different expectations and perceptions about the flow of time can cause great consternation and stress. In the United States, we have express lanes in our freeway system, and in our checkouts at the grocery store. According to a 2015 study, Malawians are the slowest walkers on earth. Americans, for the most part, can't stand waiting in line. People have come up with all kinds of psychological tricks to manage the angst of people waiting in line, like, for example, telling them to take a number, or arranging lines in such a way as they snake around and take turns every couple of feet. The amusement parks are brilliant at that. They have signs saying it's 15 minutes to the ride from this point, or it's 25 minutes you're waiting from this point, and they even have videos and, and other things that people can watch as they're waiting in line. Of course, with Cell phones now, maybe it's not such a big problem. In other countries, people might wait all day for their turn to get a visit with the doctor or to receive some service from their government. As an expat from a Western culture that is very focused on keeping time and sticking to schedules, you need to manage your expectations because you're certainly not going to make things move along any more quickly if you blow your stack. Now, taking a step back and looking at your entire life from God's perspective is also useful. Before it was a protest song in the 1960s, King Solomon wrote these words in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a 
time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Uh, timing is everything. Regarding the many moves that I've made during my 25 plus years in the public ministry, I was never actively looking to move on to somewhere else. I was pretty happy in all the places that I served as a pastor. So I never dropped a, a hint uh, to anyone else saying, uh, you know, maybe it's time for me to move on. And of course, I didn't accept every work offer that I received either. While I was uh, serving my congregation in Alabama, I received a offer to serve at a fairly large congregation in the city of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, it would have been a dual ministry. I would have been working with another man who I think I would have been able to get along with fairly well. I, Looking at the, the work that they wanted me to do, I'm pretty sure that I could have carried it out adequately. And it was also uh, an opportunity to make some pretty significant changes in that congregation's ministry plan. But I received this invitation during my youngest daughter's junior year in high school. I knew that if I took my daughter away from the school where she had gone to for three years and her friends and her JROTC program, it would have been very difficult for her to adjust. So I didn't accept that offer. Six months later, when I received the offer to move to Africa, I begged my mission board for some more time. And they actually allowed me to continue at my place of service in the United States for seven months so that my daughter could finish out her senior year of high school before we made our move. And again, I give God the credit for his timing. In his ultimate wisdom and mercy, he took my father-in-law to heaven right before we left for Malawi. And that gave us time to make our goodbyes to him and to attend his funeral. Now, looking back on all the moves that I've made during my lifetime, I can see that each one of those moves came along at just the right time. And it was a good thing that I left when I did, even though I wasn't looking to move on. And you can't always tell when it's time to leave. It's like you have an invisible expiration date stamped on your forehead. You can't see it. But when that date has passed, if other people tell you that you've started to stink, then maybe you should listen to them. How do I feel about God's timing when a change comes my way that I don't necessarily like? In the year 2003, I was not ready to leave Bulgaria, but due to circumstances out of my control, I was forced to leave. That experience truly was one of the most difficult ones of my life, tore a hole in my soul, which, thanks to God, has healed since. But as I look back on it now, 17 years later, it is helpful to remember that this episode was also a result of God's timing. Because of God's timing, I was in the right place at the right time in the year 2000 when I was able to baptize 50 Romas. Even though I am not in Bulgaria and even though our denomination doesn't have any expat missionaries in place there, their local Roma pastor is serving them very well right now. I thank God for his timing. I thank God for reminding me throughout my lifetime and even today to trust him and not myself and to rely on Christ to get the work done. 
Now, next time on home ties. Missionary work requires some pretty significant sacrifices. You give up your time with your family, comforts of home, and even your own sense of self. Not surprisingly, the missionaries that I've known over the years are some of the most focused and strong-willed people that I've ever met, because otherwise, why would you be here? But there is a significant difference between having zeal for the mission and zeal for the gospel. We'll see you next time.